Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us uh, this Sunday morning. I'm sure you all were enjoying uh, Vienna last night, so I appreciate you setting the alarm and joining us. Um, this is a, a pretty exciting panel, and as a patient advocate, I have to say I'm very excited to see uh, the industry starting to embrace this issue a little bit more. Um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to he hear a little bit from each of the panelists about their experience in the space, and then we're going to have a, a discussion. We'll have some time for Q&A from the audience. So I'm going to start us off. Um, my name is Steph Shear. I'm the founder and president of an organization called Americans for Safe Access. We were founded in 2002 and created the first uh, distribution laws in the United States for patients. Uh, when I became a patient, uh, the only laws that existed were uh, criminal exemptions, which meant if you were a patient and you were arrested and you had a letter from your doctor, you could show it to the judge and maybe they would drop the charges. <laughs> um, so not really uh, much about safe uh, access there. Uh, and as a patient, there was much more that, that we needed besides just protection from police. And so we began creating these small distribution programs that were really member collectives. Um, it was sort of how we could stretch the law in California to try to find ways to have access. We passed a few sort of open laws um, that allowed that. But these models were just patients growing a small amount of plants and taking their excess to these cooperatives and then selling it back to the members. So we weren't talking about huge commercial scale um, uh, operations. And so what we realized as patient advocates as we were moving more towards commercialization that cannabis is safe, but commercialization isn't necessarily safe. And you know, if you're growing something for yourself, you're probably less likely to put a ton of pesticides on it to save it. If you're growing something for your friends and family, uh, you're gonna treat those plants a little different. Obviously, if you're harvesting a couple plants, you're not gonna have the same issues of warehouses full of dried product. And so um, our organization in 2003 began trying to figure out how to approach product safety. We knew if we were gonna create an industry that was gonna serve patients, um, that that industry had to have rules and regulations to make sure that patients would be safe. And um, for years, we tried to do that just with the cannabis industry, bringing together people you know, from cultivation, manufacturing, dispensaries, and there was a lot of ego in the room, to be honest. So anytime <laughs> somebody didn't get their way, they would like blow up the project and say, we couldn't do it. Um, and this was also the time, you know, when I started Americans for Safe Access, there were 11 uh, dispensaries in the whole world, and they were all underground in the Bay Area of California. Uh, one was in Inglewood, California. Um, and so, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't like this big rush to get this done. And I began lobbying the American Herbal Products Association and the American Herbal Pharmacopeia in about 2003. It took about nine years <laughs> for those groups to agree to work with us. Um, but in 2011, we created the Cannabis Committee at the American Herbal uh, uh, Products Association, and we also began the Cannabis Monograph at the American Herbal Pharmacopeia the same year. And through that process, we've now created product safety guidelines for cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and laboratories. And these standards have been adopted by states across the United States, um, and now um, we've also, I've also been a part of creating a center of excellence for cannabis and cannabinoid studies in Prague in the Czech Republic, uh, where we are taking those standards from Americans for Safe Access and taking those international. And so there's lots of uh, standard setting bodies in the world. I think one of the things that, um, that I've tried to do uh, my 17 years <laughs> in working with medical cannabis, that just sounds like so long, um, is, uh, is actually try not to create cannabis specific um, projects and, um, and organizations and actually try to move cannabis into the mainstream. And so instead of creating standard setting bodies that are, are just cannabis specific, a lot of our goals has, have been reaching out like the American Herbal Products Association that was key in creating the, um, the herbal guidelines for the United States and dietary supplement guidelines for the United States, reaching out to organizations like ATSM, um, which we'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, but it's been a it's been a long it's been a long road, and I think there's this natural thing, definitely, um, I would say in, in capitalism, <laughs> that, in, that industry doesn't necessarily go out and look for their own regulations, and that there can often be a tension um, from consumers and industry about 
what should be regulated. And of course, there is, on the far end, industry at times use regulations to, to push uh, smaller companies out of, out of the industry. That's definitely something we've seen. Um, and so trying to find a balance for that has been key um, for our organization, that we don't necessarily want to have one company giving us one option as medicine. We want to see as many companies providing and, and really competing to, to bring patients the best medications uh, that they can. So the process uh, at American Safe Access of creating a patient-focused certification uh, was to create a, a certification program that included a way for industry to participate in the uh, regulations that would, that would regulate them. So through the American Herbal Products Association, the Cannabis Committee is open to anyone. They meet quarterly on cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and laboratories, and those are, standards are always evolving. And I think that can be sort of the confusing thing to people. They're like, just give me the standards, and I never want to talk about standards again. But as we know, those, this is a, it's a moving target, and it's something that has to be um, constantly addressed. The second component is transparency, that everyone should know, uh, both on the consumer side and the industry side, what those standards are and who's meeting them. Uh, at third is that there's actually education, so the people in the industry that want to follow those standards know how to do it. And the fourth is that the standards are applied equally um, whether you're in, uh, whether you're a CBD producer in Holland, or you're a um, medical cannabis uh, producer in Maine, uh, and that that a patient or a consumer can depend on those standards being met and not being the the, the level of safety. Um, it's already confusing enough for patients to try to figure out which cannabis products uh, work for us, and we really shouldn't put the burden on patients to have to figure out whether or not there are pesticides, mold, and contaminants in their products. So I'm so excited to hear from the rest of the panelists. I'll shut up now and let, uh, let our, our panelists introduce themselves and their experience in the space. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Leslie Engelking. I'm the founder of FOCUS, which stands for Foundation of Cannabis Unified Standards. Um, my background prior to getting into the cannabis industry is in mental health, nonprofit work, and pharmaceuticals. I was asked to um, open the first vertically integrated license in Phoenix, Arizona, um, when they passed medical use in 2010. So I had firsthand experience as a business owner and operator um, going from winning a license to within a couple years we had five five dispensaries and a couple grows, fused product kitchen, manufacturing lab. Um, and with that experience, I fell in love with the plant and everything that it has to bring to this world and the potential for you know, positive change. But at the same time, coming from a very um, pharma-driven compliance, safety, and quality background, I realized that we have people with compromised immune systems that are taking cannabis as medicine, and we aren't protecting them. Um, so I eventually left to start Focus. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, like Steph, we developed um, voluntary consensus standards. I really didn't know how to do that when I started. Um, I just knew it needed to happen. Um, so I followed an example that happened with the methadone clinics and the heroin epidemic in the United States. So in the 80s, when sort of heroin swept the country, within a couple of years, methadone clinics were operating in every state under all different local um, state regulations, but no federal oversight. So in that situation, the federal government took a look at it and said, we've got to do something to protect the end users, the consumers of the methadone. Um, they worked with the Institute of Medicine and Health and Human Services to put together a report and recommendation on what should happen. Um, in that report, what came out of it was that they were looking for one organization that was a nonprofit organization that would serve everyone, local, state, and federal, that would provide standards, third-party certification, and training for these methadone clinics. And so that's basically the business model we followed. Um, it's important because voluntary consensus standards mean they are adoptable into regulation. In fact, um, in most countries, it's a mandate that the federal government at least consider voluntary consensus standards when they're available. So um, we work with Steph. We also work with ASTM International um, and provided our standards for that so that they can continue to 
develop globally harmonized standards in a lot more in-depth detail. Um, we had 250 people help develop ours, and they were balanced stakeholders. So we had cannabis industry experts with their egos, um, but we also had equal amounts of regulatory, law enforcement, public health, science, medical professionals, patients, consumers, members of the public that didn't have anything to do with it. So um, they all voted through the process just the same way they do at ASTM and had to come to an agreement on what would those standards look like. So the standards are based on World Trade Organization guidelines for good manufacturing practices, good ag, um, good distribution, good production. We looked at the United States um, Code of Federal Regulations for pharmaceuticals, supplements, nutraceuticals, um, food safety, um, occupational safety and health, uh, FISMA, which is the Food Safety Modernization Act. And we just basically went through and said, what do we think needs to be changed to address the needs of the cannabis industry specifically. Um, what kind of nomenclature do we want to use so that everybody can speak the same language and know? So um, we've handed over our standard development activities to ASTM at this point. Um, we are certifying um, manufacturers, growers, um, dispensaries, and labs. And do that, um, it's, it's for business owners that are really wanting to you know, differentiate themselves in the market, of course, but um, also for import and export and really being able to um, mitigate their risk, right? So their liability, lawsuits, any of that kind of stuff. Thank you. Uh, good, good morning, uh, Nick Easley here. I'm CEO of 3C Consulting. Um, Used to be a really small Colorado-based company that now over the last decade has um, worked on pretty much almost every single state and now six continents. Um, also managing director of Multiverse Capital, a series of venture capital private equity funds and uh, deeply involved with like ASA and any of the nonprofit groups that we can help and work with. Um, never would have thought I'd get to do what I do, but originally from farm country in Wisconsin and uh, was a linguist for the Air Force and the military got hurt and that's how I was able to find cannabis, medical cannabis. And really in a place where California started this in the United States in 1996, but Colorado 2006 is when I arrived, got a medical card and saw the whole evolution of this entire medical and adult use cannabis industry from the first regulated commercial cannabis program in Colorado, seeing all the pitfalls of that. Um, we've probably worked with three, 400 different operators at this point that touch the plant in one way or another. So when you go into an operation to fix a problem where they have russet mites and pests, all these different issues and fungus problems, it's like, what's the problem here? What standards need to be used? But then we, we noticed that the operators didn't know what they were doing, the regulators didn't know what they were doing, <laughs> and then the regulators in each new market were just copying what the ones had done in the past, <laughs> and then it was just this giant <coughs> shit show of standards. And in the United That's States, in industry term, shit show. It's, <laughs> you can look it up. Um, it's <laughs> yeah. so, so now we're at this moment that we have all these different standards in the United States. The federal government couldn't create standards for us. And then what we've been trying to do is to minimize risk and investments and also operational risk. And like you said, with litigation, like lawsuits are just skyrocketing from worker protection standards, from misrepresentation of product safety or like let's just print off this logo and put it on our sticker and then we're certified like that's what certification means <laughs> so it's taken a lot of education so what we see now in, in our business processes and what we do internationally is what are the highest standards that we could potentially have to follow and it's not just one at this point because no one has really come up with this master consensus yet of industry standards specifically so we really look at all of like the good agricultural practices, GACP, anyone that was involved in the first German program realized all of those requirements. And then from the Danish programs to now Colombian programs or Uruguayan programs or what's happening in Africa or down in Australia and what <coughs> you know gloriously has happened in Canada, plus minus there on their standards, <laughs> then now we have this moment that what is right for the next market or like when we were talking about Poland earlier, it's what's going to work there. And um, I'm really just honored to be here to share with all of you what we've learned. So hopefully you don't make the same mistakes that other operators have done, or when you're setting up a business or a practice or a policy, or as we review investments, what are the biggest risks if your operators don't have standards? And it's not just for your business for protecting your downside, but like you have to be an ethically conscious company producing medicine for like sick grandparents or your sick mother or father. It's not just how can I get revenue and 
this is like GACP certified, but we could just stamp it GMP or get it to somebody <laughs> else GMP, and then they could say that it was GMP. It's like how to do this right, because what I've realized now for over a decade, which I feel like a toddler compared to some of your experience, Steph, and the others, it's how do we really create an industry that we're comfortable passing forward to future generations? Because this is only going to happen once, and it's now. And the people that were doing it from the industry were not necessarily ethically driven or thinking intergenerationally for this industry and standards. So really honored to be here to share with my experience as well. Good morning, everybody. My name is Leah, and I am a program manager at Swiss Association for Standardization. We are a ISO and SEN member. And we started with our own cannabis committee to write standards for our cannabis industry. It started in 2009, 2017, when 2016 CBD hemp has been somehow allowed in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a gray zone, we would call it. But uh, if uh, the THC, our uh, maximum level is 1%, so everything below is allowed which makes it interesting for growers and producers as well, because uh, you have the higher, yeah, the higher levels in Switzerland. And yeah, we have our own little industry that is producing. And it was quite interesting to see the, uh, our committee. We have small business and we have quite professional folks, um, agricultural students, ex-agricultural students. And they are really doing great stuff with genetics as well and uh, growing. So uh, we try to write a standard that helps Swiss producers. It's like maybe it's also terminology. If you call it handpicked, what does it mean? Or if you, yeah, so all these stuff that some think handpicked means you use a machine by hand, or is it really like you use your hand to pick the flowers or the buds and whatever? So uh, we, yeah, we really want the industry to have like a common ground so that everybody knows what is meant in our standards and yeah, what they have to look after. And uh, we have like, we want to have a set of three or five standards, a series. One would be terminology. Then we would have um, the, uh, the testing. So like the, how do you test? Uh, what are the uh, methods you can use? We would want to have uh, growing or well, um, yeah, growing and also proceeding, they will, uh, distribution and also quality management. Uh, what's really important about standards, it's always under the law, so you have to make sure that you're, that you're always above the standard. And uh, yeah, we try to, to help the industry as well in Switzerland to gain trust because it's always the same thing that the authorities think, okay, there's other potheads and but it is really a legal, a legal serious industry now. It has been, uh, we have like 600 um, registrations with the uh, authorities from uh, folks who want to grow and sell cannabis or hemp products. So we think it's time for a Swiss standard to help Swiss producers to, uh, yeah, to be compliant with law and to maybe set even a higher standard so that people know what they're selling and what they're buying. That's what we do. Thanks a lot. Hi, my name is Crystal Ortiz, and I serve on the board of the International Cannabis Farmers Association with um, Kristen Nevidal, who has a long history with Steph Sharon with the ASA and Patient Focus Certification. And uh, my roots in standards really come from a cultivator's perspective, from the back, you know, from that angle of um, a small farmer and a small cultivator. Um, I was born into the cannabis movement, and I was raised as an activist. And so my roots were in first um, social justice and human rights and turned into medical cannabis as I followed that journey. Um, I'm the first generation who came of age in 1996 when cannabis was made legal in California and participated in the early dispensary movement by bringing cannabis and, and um, anyone who was in that movement at that time um, recognized really fast that there were a lot of people that really needed cannabis for medicine and that this was no messing around and that when you do that and you serve patients with real medicine, standards come first and foremost when you know that this medicine is going to be used to help somebody in a very critical immune compromised situation. And so that's kind of where um, my roots 
began um, when the drug war really hit heavy in Northern California in the early 1980s. My family, my mom and my siblings, and I moved to Southern Arizona and I lived mo the most of my childhood in agriculture. And so the ag background has really helped me in um, understanding standards and being able to really see that this is the way that ag works and this is the way that, you know, this is our next step as cannabis producers. And especially as we go from small individual farms and families growing 10 plants in their yard to commercialized commoditization. And that um, without proper standards and without proper testing, um, our industry would be at risk and our patients and our people would still be at risk. And so through, um, throughout the years, I've um, kind of applied my agricultural background and my love for cannabis and medicine, and it's all just kind of led into this world of standards. And um, we've had lots of conversations. So I, I followed the early clean green stuff and patient focus certification when Kristen came on that. Um, with the dispensaries that I worked with, we relied upon APA's standard when that came about. There were just a handful of dispensaries in the state of California that cared about standards and testing. Still and do. Yeah, they still do. Those same ones <laughs> are still the same ones. And um, so we were really happy to have the first cannabis, what's it called, a monograph? Um, yeah. And, um, and, you know, kind of use that as a baseline for the standard that we used for the actual product. And so then now over the last couple years, farmers have been working together, cultivators with a moral high ground and with the skills to kind of take these small practices and try to apply them in a commercial way and try to set standards on a commercial scale that will work for the consumer and for the farmer. And so um, this last year, I've had the honor and pleasure of serving with the technical advisory committee that uh, Dr. Bronner's group has been working on, a standard called Sun and Earth Certified, and you can find that at sunandearthcertified.org. And that is a really high standard. It's the highest cannabis cultivation standard that I've ever had the pleasure of working on. And the 10 or 12 um, farms that are kind of at the table there, I think all of us look at each other and not one of us meet, meets the standard you know, that we're setting. <laughs> and so that's a, another level. That's a branding and marketing and um, different than just the, you know, the standards for health and safety. And so it's been really fun. And I feel really inspired to be a part of all of these groups of people working and when I hear each one of us individually talking about all the standards work we've been doing, I imagine the hundreds and hundreds of hours we've wasted by not working together <laughs> and sharing. But, um, but yeah, it is really awesome, and I'm happy to see this next evolution for myself, which takes the standard away from just being clean and just being good enough and goes into um, more of a marketable and a position where people can understand the protected terms and understand the terminology behind craft and small batch and estate grown and all of those things which are, to me, in the crux of it, going to create the value add, which is going to encourage those smaller farmers to survive. And so that's kind of the next evolution, um, which still entails protection for the patient for me in the end. So um, that's my history there, and I'll pass on from here. Uh, anyone has uh, headphones? Because I will uh, speak uh, in Polish language, beautiful language, but pro probably will not understand any one word. Uh, just try to put the heads, headphones on the he your heads. Nazywam się Jakub Gajewski. My name is Kuba Gajewski. I come from Poland. Reprezentuję... I represent the NGO called Free uh, Cannabis, Wolne Konopie. We work on drug regulation reform in Poland, social education. And we act on a grassroots level. But first and foremost, we act to um, fight for the laws of patients in Polish courts. In Poland, it's not as easy um, as it is, for instance, in the U.S., even though uh, you know, there are pro problems in the U.S. as well. 
So I'd like to, first of all, I would like to um, thank Seth that on behalf of her work, we can um, use and have the access to the information that been that has been gathered in, 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 in her work and we are ready um, to implement any standards that relate to cannabis or hemp in Poland. So I'm very pleased that I can be here, that I can say a few words about Polish drug policy in Poland, because I'm sure you don't know um, much about it. I am in Vienna for the second time. First time I came here 12 years ago. This was an event organized in the UN in terms of drug policy. So I came here dressed as a prisoner with a big banner that we should all free the cannabis prisoners. We wanted to um, fulfill a statement, a petition on the hands of any of the UN um, authorities because our friends spent one year or two years in jail in Poland for having like 0 0.1 gram of cannabis. So it was it was huge tra tragedies, you know, that we encountered and these people encountered. So we came here to Vienna to postulate and to fight for a change in drug laws. We haven't been treated very well. We've been thrown away uh, from, uh, uh, from the office of the UN and the terrorist attack was launched. So every, uh, everybody had to stay on the floor for half an hour because nobody understood what really happened. Nobody understood that we were dressed as criminals and that we came, came here to fight for the drug laws. <sighs> After the evacuation uh, of all uh, of the buildings, the people that work for UN who were leaving the buildings saw us and um, asked why why, uh, why there was a terrorist attack launched and what are we doing here. So that's when we told them exactly what, what I just told you, that in Poland you can go to jail for 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of uh, cannabis. And these are actual cases that happened in Poland back then. And they promised us they're going to work towards the change so it doesn't repeat itself. So now I'm happy that I, that I can be here in this place because it is also the UN once again. Right now I'm wearing a suit, not a prisoner outfit and I'm able to tell you a few words. So, so I'm very empowered by that. And I think that is the sign that mentality in terms of the subject changes, not only here but also in Poland. I have to admit that. That said, from 1999 in our country in our country when the, where the prohibition was implemented we have the most restrictive laws in the whole eu still it is perfectly possible that for a very very small amount of of uh, marijuana you can actually get a prison sentence A few people that had taken this sacrifice has, however, um, helped the case and raised public awareness in prosecutors, in the courts. So today, such cases are mainly, you know, we are, we are, we are being treat, treat, treated uh, better. We've been beaten. My nose was once broken because I had a joint with myself. So today it, it actually is better. But nevertheless, Polish drug laws are the most restrictive drug laws in the EU. However, the level of misinformation in the public debate uh, was still 
very high. The whole discussion about marijuana started um, when the discussion about heroin in the 90s started in Poland. So people didn't really differentiate between the two drugs. So it's very, very rough to change drug policy because there's big misunderstanding about, you know, how how very different classes of drugs, uh, um, how how they're different. To give you of, of the example of how difficult it was, one of our activists actually hanged himself in school because he'd been thrown away from the home when police found a very tiny amount of uh, cannabis with him. So he didn't, he, he didn't, react uh, well to this pressure and he committed suicide. I would like to repeat that I am speaking about what happened 10 years ago and I know it is changing but we are still not there yet. I would like also to tell you that Poland has its own definition of uh, cannabis. In Poland, it's considered, cannabis is considered, it's not only flowers, but the, the whole plant. So even if you grow one, one plant, then you face the criminal charge of 15 year uh, penalty, criminal penalty. So we still um, face a lot of uh, misinformation. Uh, and because of, uh, of this uh, repression, we launched uh, Volna Konopia NGO. We started on a grassroots level. We thought it's police who's uh, behind all that. So we fought police. And when we develop, develop and we, when we matured, we actually realized uh, that, that the problem is, is deeper, the, that the problem is in the realm of politics. And unfortunately, Polish politicians uh, still um, still have 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 their, their their own view on the war on drugs and, and they're not very supportive. So they entered, they actually entered uh, the parliament in the, you know, in the 90s um, by using the whole narrative of the war on drugs. This is how, how they established their careers. We organized, as I told you, we organized. We started on a grassroots street level. We petitioned. We organized manif manifestations, and we've been marginalized. And uh, of course, um, small growers and users have been mainly marginalized. After a few years, we managed to make it to the. To, to the politics and some media started to get interest about our actions because we managed to deliver interesting content. We won a court law. We, um, we won a court law with the former president of Poland when we uh, proposed that everybody should be able to cultivate free uh, free plants. So we wanted to submit this project, and we won we won in the court um, because we managed we 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 managed at least to 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 vote for it. It didn't happen, but we had this possibility. It's for you perhaps. It's even hard to understand that we have to fight for our uh, ability to voice our opinion. We fought in the court uh, to the right to demonstrate uh, on behalf of the cannabis movement. So our civil rights in Poland are being broken very often, and I know it can be it can be very hard to understand and grasp here in the Western Europe. We also won a court on constitutional tribunal. 
that opened the door for medical cannabis access. So it was a big breakthrough in Poland because constitutional tribunal, it's still influenced by, uh, by the ruling party and by the politicians but it opened the door for medical uh, cannabis. So the court said that um, using medical cannabis is in essence in accordance with the Polish constitution. So it can kind of uh, send a signal to the parliament that something has to be done in terms of uh, medical marijuana. And this is when media and politicians actually start to get interested in the subject. So this was 2014. That's only then when we've been um, invited to, to the media, because before that, uh, before that, we didn't even have the opportunity to voice out our arguments in mainstream media. So in 2014, actually, that's the first time that something broke through and changed. And because our argumentation and because of the knowledge uh, from staff, um, we were able to communicate the truth about cannabis, little by little. So in 2015, uh, a famous rapper and a hip hop artist, quite controversial um, artist, got, got elected to the Polish parliament. And he was one of our activists. His name was Leroy. So when he got to the parliament, he actually issued a bill on medical cannabis. Uh, we were based, we base our project on the information and the regulations that have been implemented in different states in different countries. We kind of like adjusted that to the Polish circumstances. And it, even though that we've been considered as disorganized um, and a cult uh, uh, and considered a crime organization, even, even though there was still a big stigma against um, drug use because the fact that we've been showing patients who use medical cannabis, we managed to influence public perception and uh, discussion around the topic of cannabis. So this is when Poles got, um, on a m major scale, got interested uh, in, in cannabis and its properties. So to come back to the project, it basically, it in its in its essence, it uh, we wanted that everyone um, would be able to to grow their own um, grow their own cannabis in research units should have been able to grow cannabis uh, while being supervised by regulatory authorities. However, because uh, of the right wing. Um, politicians and the ruling party, it was basically, let's say, freezed and disappeared from um, from, from the regulator, regulatory process for a year or so. In 2016, we um, organized an opinion poll among, uh, among the people, uh, and it came out that 81% of people support the introduction of medical cannabis in Poland. So this is when something changed. On the Committee of Health, the politicians who, who've been opposing medical cannabis have been actually arguing who was the first supporter. So they completely changed their opinion in view of the, of, of the grassroots um, the pressure and information that people actually, the Polish people actually support the use 
um, of uh, medical cannabis. We, and almost all of the MPs in the parliament voted to implement um, the bill. However, it was changed in a lot of in a lot of ways because in Poland, usually, it is the government who um, who is able to implement the bill that. Uh, implement the bills. So, and because the politicians are misinformed and not educated, they decided to propose their own medical cannabis project and they voted for their own medical cannabis project. So, so the government uh, introduced um, introduced a few good a uh, few good rules for cannabis cultivation. Can right now in Poland, cannabis can be uh, prescribed for any disease for up to uh, 90 days by any doctor. There doesn't need to be uh, you don't need to use other drugs before you start to use. Uh, cannabis. You you can use uh, flowers, extracts, uh, any form of of cannabis is actually available, and it depends on the doctor and the patient. So what is wrong about this bill is that there is it's not going to be uh, funded, and patients cannot grow their own cannabis, and there is no um, there there is no. Polish uh, cannabis cultivation. So the only way we can do that is that we can actually import uh, cannabis from the abroad. And our government was really misinformed. So when they implemented the bill, they were such misinformed, they even thought that the only place that we can uh, import cannabis is India, because it's cannabis indica. So they unconsciously kind of created a situation when uh, well, and the Minister of Health, in official statement, actually, uh, actually, actually told that, that, that they are sure that everybody else is is issuing their their cannabis from India as well. So this is just to illustrate the level of misinformation within the government in Poland. <laughs> Right now, the government reached an agreement with uh, Canada, who uh, last Friday uh, imported the first, um, the first, uh, the first batch of the product. So we, so, so we're gonna have like one strain available in uh, January 2019 at Polish pharmacies. In this year, what we managed to do is that we lobbied for uh, the research units to um, cultivate their own cannabis. However, we are still waiting for the secondary regulations. We don't, we don't really know how it's going to look like. Uh, we still wait for the secondary regulation. So to sum up, because I don't want to spend too much time, um, it's very difficult to work for rational drug regulation in Poland. It's very difficult not to lose uh, your own health. And everything in Poland actually comes uh, late and Poland lags behind the other countries. So even if the United Nations implements some of the um, standards or, and regulations, um, Poland will most likely be the last of the countries to actually implement that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cuba.
You know, I, I, um, and thank you for sharing that, that history with us, because I think what is um, really an exciting component of standards from a patient advocacy point of view is that once we created the American uh, Herbal Pharmacopeia monograph, that monograph was used worldwide to move medical cannabis programs forward. You had a situation where there was a political will of the politicians, there was maybe public support, um, but the regulatory bodies that were being asked to follow that will um, realized it was, it's a lot of work to create standards. I mean, it takes, it takes years. So, um, you know, it, it's really exciting to see how standards, um, now that they're out there, are pushing these programs and, and rapidly. You know, I keep saying the world is getting smaller, but the flights are still long. But literally everyone around the globe is, is, moving, is moving forward. I've been on like six continent, or five continents in the last six weeks. Um, but um, but I, what I wanted to talk to the panel about is, um, uh, is about the consumer side of this, right? Like governments um, can put standards out, they can require that companies follow them, but without enforcement, uh, it doesn't really mean much. And, I, and I, that's what I'm seeing all over the globe, that people are like th setting high standards and then there's no way that, that consumers know um, that those are being followed. And so I'm just wondering if you guys have thought about consumer education so that there's consumer demand and sort of filling up that component because I, I don't think most patients ordering CBD on the internet understand what contaminants are and what, and, and what they can do to their health. So just anyone who wants to take it, go ahead. Do you want to take it first? Yeah, I mean, it, there's no question that patients don't have any idea of the risk that are posed. And again, it's not because cannabis as a plant is unsafe, but manufacturing at the scale that's happening today brings a lot of other risks that weren't there before. Um, I do think it's super important to have a consumer-driven need for a safe quality product. Um, the more patients and consumers speak up about that and the public, um, the more the industry will drive it. And I know, you know, from my personal experience, when I started talking about standards um, in 2013, I felt like every time I got off a stage, I had a big target on my back because what I found was the industry really didn't understand the difference between a standard and a regulation and a law. And so they thought I was just trying to push further regulation on them when, in fact, it's the exact opposite. I was building this because I was a business owner in you know, my previous job and really needed this kind of guidance. Um, so I think the more patient education, um, you know, your group with, with ASA and is, it's critical. Um, Focus is not a, a patient advocacy organization. We ultimately serve the patients and the consumers, but we work with industry and regulatory to do that. So it's a little different, but at the end of the day, if we can't produce safe, quality, consistent products, we're never going to get anywhere. And standards are the roadmap for that. Hello, hello. Yeah, the consumer education piece is um, where we are in the California cannabis economy right now is, um, you know, luckily cannabis has come of age right now in this time where small breweries are good and where craft, you know, where organic food is important and where farmers markets are important. So there's always that consumer that's out there that's going to look and that's going to ask those questions. Um, the difficulty with um, the dispensary patients and the, you know, the patients that are coming in into the dispensary is that they have not been served in that way by the dispensaries. And so though they don't they have this image in their mind, you know, as a consumer of cannabis, the image that you're going to see is this hippie watering their plant with chicken poop, you know, and just sitting there doing this beautiful job. And so the patients don't even know what they don't know. And so we're way cart before the horse in having this educated consumer base to even consider that potentially the cannabis that they've been consuming could have pesticides on it, could be endangered, could be contaminated. They don't know the carbon footprint. You know, there's a lot of layers to that consumer education piece. And I think that one of the more inspiring parts about this most recent work, and I really kind of came in at the tail end with the Dr. Bronner, with David Bronner and their, um, the Sun and Earth Certified Group through other communi community groups, was um, that 
everything that they touch has that standard behind it all around the world, from coconut oil to soap to fair trade to olives produced in Palestine to all these amazing things that they do. And so um, that really brand solid awareness that you know when you go to grab that product that the work has been done was one of the most inspiring parts of kind of like looking to that side was because that work is there and that doesn't exist in the cannabis space right now. And the third party certification programs um, have also been relatively predatory, you know, not meaning to be, but they were doing the work to get the funding by getting the farmers to want to do it and telling the farmers, do this, do this, do this. This is going to really make your product stand out in the crowd without putting the work in on the other end to the consumer and doing that consumer education piece so that it even had value in the marketplace. So in California, you know, we've, we've come really far, really fast from just bulk commodity unknown, you don't know the farmer, you don't know anything about it, to brands and packages and in this and childproof and all of these other things. And so I think that the consumer education piece is the biggest piece and the hardest piece and the most daunting at the moment. You know, I, I, I've seen that and definitely agree. You know, I, I live in California now, even though we started Colorado, but we're kind of everywhere. And one of the things, like with Poland, for example, like, are the patients in Poland going, like, is patient education there that's going to be important for the standards? It's like, there's one, like, so access is the main thing. Like, even in California, with the new laws and regulations coming out, we could educate patients and consumers all day, but oftentimes it's like, are you meeting the regulatory thresholds as the businesses or the producers of doing those standards to even have products that someone could buy in the first place? And I've seen, you know, from the sun grown or certified pesticide free or clean green certified, or you even think about the state of Washington, it has its organic certification okay. or Oregon has its certification. Then there's the USDA and then, you know, made in Colorado, like <laughs> there's a lot of misinformation there and when it comes to access, mostly, it's like, can you compliantly sell your products and produce at these high standards? I really think that the consumer education piece is, it's vital, but it's not as critical over this next two to three years, because really, I mean, you think about in German pharmacies, like in API contracts for governments, like what they're actually getting isn't, you know, these big branded products that people think, oh, I want this brand of cannabis or that brand. If, if you go to a dispensary in Colorado or Washington or Las Vegas, You'll, you'll maybe choose, but almost the differentiating items, like the little lo logos on the packaging, like that's not what I see consumers like doing. It's, um, I think the education component though on like what products to be using, what to watch out for specifically of like, is this vaporizer have glycol in it? Does it have flavor additives? Is, does it have like terp sauce like that has potentially like very dangerous compounds in it? And I would love just to have one standard, but now those standards for consumers we were talking earlier, it's like you just say you're ISO certified and you're good to go, or you say you're GMP certified, or I've even seen on product labels, this is GMP certified cannabis. And like, <laughs> you don't certify the cannabis as GMP, you're certifying the processes. Um, or even like, you know, the organic logo just being misused. And you think long term for misrepresentation and fraud? Colorado, I think it was 2014, we saw like patient advocacy groups suing LiveWell for misrepresentation, saying this was like pesticide free, even though it had been recalled, quarantined, and then six months later sold for one penny to veterans. Like, you know, so it's that consumer education piece is hard, but I would say not to look out for, for what to buy, but more importantly, what to avoid. That's easier, at least at this point. Okay. Well, in Switzerland, our consumers, they expect products to be safe, to be GMP free and to be pesticide free. And they would be shocked if you would tell them, well, <laughs> not always, but I'm from a food background and it's the same in the food industry. You expect those products to be safe and people do not know what is applied while growing. So I personally think our standards or the standard we want to develop is more for the industry and not for the consumers. We do not do certification and we do not strive to have a label or something like that. It's more that the, uh, the growers speak the same language, that they know how to do it and that they know how to test their products. So uh, yeah, personally, we don't think that the label is necessary because consumers already accept products to be safe. Unfortunately, legal doesn't always mean safe in this industry. <laughs> Una 
nas w Polsce jest jeden wielki chaos. In po standaryzacji żadnej nie ma mowy. Chaotic, because there is no standardization whatsoever. Uh, we, the activists in uh, Wolne Konopie and patients, uh, people gathered around the initiative, we, 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 we take this responsibility to educate patients um, in terms of how the product should look like, what should it contain, because the state is not doing that. So we opened the cannabis info points when anyone who's interested in uh, cannabis can actually get the information um, to avoid certain risks to inform himself. And from our own, uh, we found our resources. We are, we are training doctors, we are training patients. And again, this is grassroots. So, however, because of the prohibition in Poland, and a long history of uh, the hemp industry uh, at the same time, we are one of the biggest pr producers of CBD extracts, extracts in Europe. Uh, among others, uh, our sponsor, the Canabi Gold, is the biggest uh, CBD producer in, in Europe, I guess. So, so they have a lot of uh, influence on how to um, develop a standardized uh, product, but it also because other pro producers, uh, people seem to r realize more and more what, should, what they should look for. So this is because of the industry leaders, not the state, that we can even talk about standardization in Poland. I think I personally checked about 1,000 samples of cannabis. And in uh, this, this like black market, and uh, when we checked them in the test, we actually saw that, well, that's the quality is not really very high. 50% of, of that should be thrown away to the garbage right away because there is no regulation and the state doesn't know anything about it. And it doesn't want to listen to us. I hope it's gonna change. And certainly it's starting to shift also in the minds of politicians and uh, regulatory officials. However, right now it's us who can um, serve this role and uh, contribute with that. And, and our opportunities are limited in this. Uh, uh, we hope that uh, Canadian company that's gonna um, export uh, cannabis to Poland um, is also gonna it's gonna also play a role in, in in standardization and knowledge basically education knowledge for the Polish patients I just wanted to add I think um, what you were saying about the industry driving this and and everything is a very important thing um, when we're looking at the sustainable development goals for the UN right they're looking at innovation and infrastructure and stuff and in other industries that have developed it's come from a need this industry is really developed by passionate people like yourselves who have put themselves out there and and become advocates and business owners in a very unstable um, unsure marketplace and I think it's really it's important to realize that um, and I think part of the beauty of this conference and what Kenzie's put together is to really make global change at any level or to change stigma, we need one unified voice. Um, we can't be yelling. It has to be a very compassionate, a very understanding and you know, full of active listening type of voice and it needs to be consistent across the world. Thank you. I think that's what's interesting is that we started with um, the sort of medical cannabis space in the last um, the last few years, I think you guys have heard of CBD products, right? and, um, have flooded the market who are sort of outside of these regulatory uh, protocols that we've created. And as um, Europe is moving forward, as the rest of the world, we're starting to see 
um, medical cannabis programs that look less like compassionate use, which means like give a patient whatever you've got and they should be happy with it, I think is sort of how compassionate use is come up to actually having standardized products that are in pharmacies that are prescribed and can be covered by insurance that has actually made a jump from compassionate use to medical. We, and so as, as Nick mentioned, those products have to go through the GMP you know, standards. And so um, you know, not, not that all, all medicines are safe, but you at least have this pretty big infrastructure um, that patients can rely on. Um, and in the US for patient, for product safety, um, patient advocates had always, we've always been in this very weird limbo that, you know, the people who provide medical cannabis uh, or recreational cannabis and now hemp in the United States are all breaking federal law. So we, it was a very hard to say, like, if, like is, is the, um, should the punishment for providing patients uh, a medicine with mold, should that be federal prison for 15 years? And that was sort of the, the, the situation that patient advocates were in. Like we felt uncomfortable talking about product safety and it's really been unfair because patients have fought to create this industry. This industry is a byproduct of patient advocacy and the fact that industry was willing to just serve, you know, give, give patients crap was really a hard line. But outside of the US where we're seeing national programs, that's, that's changing. But now, thinking like we have this vision for medical cannabis, now we have this dietary supplement, food, stuff, maybe it's a nutraceutical um, industry that, um, as Leah mentioned, uh, countries are, 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 are kind of trying to jump, jump ahead. I know the EU is working on creating some, some, standardized, or some standards for foodstuffs and, and those products. Um, but it's like a, a whole new area now for advocacy and, and, and patient education. And I love what you said, Leah, that, that like, you know, all, all, all citizens in your country expect that if something is being sold in the country, it's safe. I would not say that's the truth in the United States, but um, uh, it's sort of, yeah, exactly. But, I, but I, that sort of leads me into the next question, which is, I wanna ask the panelists, when do, we, when, when do you see us moving from standards as being a um, something that, that is, is having to be developed by, um, by advocates and pushed by consumers and just the way it is, you know, like, like that, that in order to sell a product in this space that you're going to follow the, the, the laws, any laws around human consumption, which don't, ex you know, they, they exist. There's nothing that's sold in most places that, that there aren't regulations. And now that we have these standards, what is it going to take for us for the industry not to ask, should we have standards? I mean, if somebody asks me that again, I'm gonna lose it. Um, <laughs> like, yes, you, if you wanna sell something, you have to have standards. So what, what do you think the, and this will be the last question for the panel. So um, what do you think it's gonna take that that is just going to be the, the state of, of the world of, of these products? Well, that currently exists and now, um, maybe it's the investor side of thinking. I think about market risk. So like team risk, market risk, product risk. If there's product risk, if a company we invest into could get sued for something, that could potentially hurt the returns to the investors. Or if, let's say, the market changes and they say, like, no longer legal, or now there were five licenses, now there can be 100. So you have to be compliant to those standards today from a business standpoint. So it doesn't matter about looking good or educating patients. It's really about not losing your ability to do business. And if you're a hands-on operator and you have a license, it's mandatory to follow those standards, like for investment capital to be there, for investors to be happy with this, or for regulators to like trust you. And that's really like the thing that you have to think about when you're considering how are we gonna operate and regulate our own businesses? Because when you look at the industry trying to do self-regulation, I worked for the Department of Agriculture in Colorado back when we were first doing the first new pesticide laws of any new regulated market. And I remember thinking like, hey, why do we not just use tobacco testing? because that's the only other product that has pyrolysis data that knows like what happens when you burn a pesticide and inhale it. So we just did that, but that knocked off like 400 pesticides from the approved list, one of which was like mycobutanol, you know, hydrogen cyanide after you like burn it. And it's like, hey, this shouldn't be allowed, but then industry groups are like, we need these pesticides to be able to do our industry or you'll lose your tax revenue, you'll lose your jobs. So as a business owner in an operator, like if it's national or international, 
whatever the standards are for anything that you normally would have to do, like in the United States, um, like Food and Drug Administration, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Occupational Health and Safety Administration, none of those agencies are regulating the cannabis industry because those are federal regulations and we are breaking their laws so they can't tell us how to do what we're doing illegally. But you can still go on Google and find these regulations and know what you have to do for like worker protective standards or pesticide applicator trainings. All these new states and countries don't understand that. So as a business owner operator, you must follow standards yesterday. And like it, it's a CYA policy, cover your ass. Because if you're not producing at standards, you could get shut down, you could have recalls. You think about some of the com companies that have those huge recalls. I remember Mahatma Extracts back in Colorado, like on the front page of the Denver like paper, it's like this company, all these pesticides, and then it started over and over and over again. When you then go into a dispensary and you see their products, you're like, ooh, dirty. It's one of those things that you can never recover from brand damage or losing your license to operate. So if I invest $10 million into a project and they break rules and then they lose their license from that government, there's no revenue there. Like everything's done. So you must do that from that standard. And on the international side, most important for any operators to do internationally, like GRASP standard, like as part of global gap, like good agricultural practices. That's one as part of this like sustainable development I really like from like worker protected protection standards, fair trade standards. But GAP, GACP, GMP, GDP, you must do those now and work towards those standards, even if you're not required. Otherwise, you're not going to have your license to do business in the future. Yes, I'm absolutely with you. We always say uh, we have it from the financial markets. Um, if you do not write standards before regulation, regulation will come and then they will write directives and then it gets really <laughs> expensive. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we need an industry that is, um, they, they, know, they, need, they know what they want to sell and then somehow knows best what they can do, so they need to set the standards, they need to set high standards, and afterwards regulation won't do anything because they're happy with the standards, but if you do not do standards, or if you don't write standards and follow standards, then it's the regulatory that will come and make the standards, and sometimes they don't know what they regulate. <laughs> Yeah, both of those things are exactly what I would say. I was unfortunate that my initial reaction when you said, what can we do was, or how is it going to happen? And it was to get people licensed so that they protect their licenses. You know, once they have this ability to do what they're doing and their business, they are going to want to protect it and have to protect it. And so um, fortunately, unfortunately, it comes down to business and dollars and cents. And I really think that standards, um, what's really going to work to implement them is at every level of the supply chain that the standards matter from the retailer to the consumer to the cultivator, you know, at every level of the supply chain, that they're real, they're enforced, and they're enforceable. And, um, you know, I think that at, coming from an ag perspective, I think that the standards that we've set in California are really, really high, the highest standards for any product, the agricultural product I've ever seen before. And I imagine that in no time, um, once it is a business and the standards are there and things are stable, that they will loosen because the pesticide lobby will find their way to do the pyrolysis testing and to do all these other things to prove things are safe that are not safe. And so for right now, it really comes down to protecting the dollars and cents. Um, I was, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, I was just gonna say, um, I think the question was, when do we think the industry will, will be ready for this, right? And I, I think we're getting there. Um, I know for my company, we do offer certification, but we don't do any marketing or advertising at all, or PR. Um, so businesses come to us through our website or through word of mouth referral, and that number has dramatically increased week over week for the past year. Um, I also think part of, I, I agree completely with what you're saying about, you know, it needs to be in part of regulations, it also needs to be enforced and enforceable. Um, I spend a lot of time educating FDA officials, and one of the first things that I talk about with them is 
okay, so cannabis has the ability to create a very visceral reaction in everybody, positive or negative, right? I mean, you're an advocate and you love it, you're, you're a regulator, you hate it, whatever that is, but if, that, if they can take their mind out of thinking about it like cannabis and look at this as a consumer product like any other consumer product and how do we make sure that that is safe for the end users, um, that they can get beyond that stigma and they can sort of see through the, the haze, if you will, to, to really do the right thing. So I think, to me, part of it is educating the regulators and policymakers and everybody else. Odpowiadając na twoje pytanie, Steph, uh, answering your question, kiedy będzie, kiedy to w Polsce się stanie? Uh, when will be ready in Poland? Uh, I really don't know. I think it's a generational problem. Um, as long as young educated people won't um, actually enter into positions of power and enter in the parliament and replace the people that mentally live in, um, in, in the last decade, it's not going to change. We can, um, um, we can accelerate this process by education and by sharing knowledge. Thanks to all the companies that are already present, and they do, and companies that do develop their own standards, regardless of whether there is regulation or not. I just can hope that international pressure can show to our decision makers that we need to implement these standards to truly protect health, safety uh, of Polish consumers. And I hope it's going to happen in the next few years. However, I'm quite pessimistic. I think it's going to take a little more than that. I want to say thank you to this panel. This has been um, amazing to hear all the different perspectives. I think for, um, I'm hopeful that uh, in the near future we're going to move away from uh, cowboys uh, that uh, see profits over patients. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we can uh, you know, really jump into a, a space where uh, consumers can uh, pick these products, uh, especially the over-counter and, and online products, in the same way that they would uh, feel safe about grapes or any, any, other, any other product. Uh, and I think the way that we're going to do that is everyone uh, in this room that wants to see this industry succeed and wants it to be an open market where we have many companies participating, um, then it's going to mean self-regulation as well as uh, educating yeah, regulators and consumers. So thank you guys all so much. Thank, thank we can't run a pause for the, our panelists.